Okay, we might get started because we've got a fair bit to go through um, and the latecomers can just catch up or, or look at the video once we've uploaded it at the end of the session. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen and then hear me okay. If you can't, just type in the little chat window and we'll, we'll try and sort it out. Um, for you, those of you who don't know me, my name's Joel Ben. I'm a business analyst here in uh, ANS Canberra and I've been working on the, the R10 release um, with the development team for the past six months or so. Um, and I'm going to take you through the, the release today, just the demo of the release today. Um, so first of all, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of what's happened for the registry in R10. Um, basically, it's undergone a, a complete rewrite from the ground up, so it's, it's all new code, um, and the developers have done a really amazing job um, to get it up to scratch with new technology. Um, the core functionality in the registry is much the same, um, but it has a new modern design and new architecture behind it. Uh, which we'll go through. Um, obviously, it's with the new technology and the architecture, it's going to be easier to main, maintain going forward um, and for other people to, to basically develop on top of what we've done. Um, it, it's, it basically facilitates open source um, community development. So a lot of the stuff we've got is um, open source up on Git and people can basically download that and start developing um, plugins or, or enhancing what we've got there. Um, there's much better performance uh, across the registry, so we'll go through a few things, but things like harvesting and records management are substantially quicker, um, which you'll notice as we go through the demo. Um, we do now have um, support for multiple schemas, um, ingesting multiple schemas. Um, we don't actually have any in place at the moment, um, but going forward when we start to do crosswalks between other schemas and RIVCS, you will actually be able to uh, be able to harvest um, records in that schema and import them into the registry. Um, so without further ado, I will get uh, started. Um, hopefully you can all see the login screen here. Um, basically, I'm in a development box at the moment, so the login page that you see here is actually for built-in staff users. Um, what you're likely to see when you access it on uh, day one of, sort of Go Live is the AAF login. Um, and it, it operates exactly how it used to in the registry. You just click the login to AAF, you enter your AAF details, and you'll be um, navigated back to the registry once that's successful. But for today, I'll just log in as a staff member. Okay, so the first thing you'll notice when we log in, uh, we get taken to what is called the services dashboard. Uh, and from the services dashboard, it, it basically, on the left-hand side here, we have a little bit of, um, uh, basically a box with news information. Um, so you can see here we've got um, information about the, the R10 release. Um, we have some help links, basically where to go for help on, in the registry. And the top two here will have um, some day one help for R10. And the next one down is going to be a video link, um, which will sort of be a screencast, and you can sort of find your way around the around the registry uh, in a video. Um, the tour video is also available up here in the right hand side, um, just via the tour link up here. So they're, they're um, some quick and easy ways to get help once you log in on day one. The other things you'll notice um, are the my data sources and my vocabulary box on the right here, and that basically gives you access um, to the vo your vocabularies and your data sources that you've um, got access to. Now you can see at the moment I have quite a few um, data sources listed here. Most of you will only have one or two listed in the box there. The top right-hand menu um, on the screen is available in all pages in the registry, um, and that's basically the, the high-level menu in the registry to access the services. So the first one we have is My Data, and that's how you access um, all, the, all your records in your data sources and your data source um, configurations. The identifiers is for the PIDs or handle service that we have available, and also the DOI um, Site My Data um, interface. The vocabularies which were released in R9 is how you can upload and manage um, vocabularies that you've got um, in your institution. And the tools are just a couple of quick links um, to, to development items and, and web services that we've got in the registry. You'll notice that there is a little search icon at the top. Um, in the previous version of the registry, we had a, we had a pretty um, uh, full-on search. In the new registry, it's, it's quite a simple search. 
Um, if you want to do more advanced searches, then you're, you're probably better off doing that in Research Data Australia and finding the records that way. Um, but just by clicking the little search icon, you can put in a search term and it will bring back the records that match that. The little user icon in the top right hand corner, um, that's how you basically log in and log out. Um, and also you can change your password. So just by clicking on that, you can log out um, or you can change your password for your um, user account. Um, okay, so basically, um, as I said before, these the my data source box and my vocabulary just gives you quick links um, to the, your data sources and the vocabulary. So by just clicking on one of these, I can directly access my data sources. The other way to access uh, your data sources is via the My Data menu up the top left here. By clicking on that, I get the option to um, manage my data sources. So if I just click on that, it'll take me to the Manage My Data Sources page. Now, this page um, will give you a listing of all the data sources that you have access to um, by your organisational membership within the registry. Um, for those users who only have one data source in the registry, when you click the Manage My Data Sources page, you'll actually be navigated directly to the dashboard because um, there's no point really coming to this page for a single data source. If you have multiple, you'll see this page um, and it'll give you quick access to all the data sources that you have. So on the page, there's a couple of links on the right hand side here um, where you can access the dashboard, which, shows you, which I'll go through in a second, um, the Manage button where you manage your records, and also the settings where you configure your data source account settings. It also gives you a quick summary of the records within each of your data sources. So you can see the coloured icons just on the left here. It's showing me that I have 54, uh, 44 draft records and 77 published records in this data source. Um, they also act as quick links to the Manage My Records page. So by clicking on this draft icon, it'll actually take me to the Manage My Records page and um, filter it just by those draft records showing me the 44. To access um, your data source dashboard, you can either click the link here at the top, which is the, the title of the data source, or you can click the dashboard button um, on the right here. Okay, so I think that's it for that page, so I'll move on. So the next page you'll see, um, which is the landing page for a data source. So if you only have one data source um, on the AND services dashboard and you click that link, this is the page that you'll land on first. Um, basically, the dashboard um, gives you another op an, a number of options to access the screens, um, which basically let you manage and, and configure your data source. So we have the edit settings, which allows you to edit the data source account settings. Again, the manage records page um, and to view your deleted records. You'll also notice up the top right, we have now a sub-level blue menu, dashboard, manage records, reports and settings. And this menu, um, is basically shown when you're inside a data source. So it relates to all the pages that are relevant to a data source account. Um, the, the, the dashboard is currently highlight, highlighted blue um, because I'm actually on the dashboard. If I switch to one of the other pages, they'll highlight blue as well. Um, on this page, we have the activity log, which used to be found in the um, data source account page. And the activity log gives you uh, basically an, an overview of the activity that's happened in your data source account. So you'll think, see things like uh, when your data source account settings have been changed, when you've done a harvest, when it's been scheduled, things like that. <coughs> Each of the items in the activity log are uh, clickable, so I can just click the heading and it'll actually expand down and give me more details. So this one is just telling me that a, a scheduled harvest was cancelled. It gives me the details of when it was cancelled um, and the actual harvest that was scheduled originally. A um, couple of things in the activity log. You also have a filter on the top right here. So if you've, uh, the activity logs um, don't get cleared at all. Um, so we, we store the history ongoing. In the previous registry, we had a clear button for users to clear it. We actually have removed that, so we were storing everything, um, which helps us to do troubleshooting if something goes wrong in your data source account. Now, the little filter op option up the top here allows us to filter by errors. So if there's any errors within your data source, um, you can just filter by those and, and have a look through them. So you'll see the top one here is been unable to schedule a harvest. I click on that and it's most likely that there's something wrong um, with my URL. In some of the errors, um, I'll try and find one. Mm -hmm. 
you will have a little red um, question mark over here on the, the right hand side. That's actually clickable and it'll give you a little pop up with some uh, basically some uh, tips and help um, to try and troubleshoot the problem with the harvest. Um, so it's just giving you a little bit of information on what could have gone wrong and some reference of where to look to, to get help before you need to contact services at ANS. Um, the show more button down at the bottom of the activity log. Basically, as I said, we don't clear the logs anymore, so they can get pretty big pretty quickly. Um, so we're only showing, I think, it's the first 10 um, items. And just by clicking show more, you can go through the log um, and see past entries. Uh, also, a thing to note on the activity log, um, in, the, in the previous uh, activity log in the data source account, we had a refresh button that basically you'd have to click to get the, um, the latest entries in the log. Now when you do a harvest or, or any activity, it'll actually refresh itself. So if I did a harvest, it, and I'll go through that in a second, it'll actually refresh the log and show me the entries as they happen. Um, come through the no clear. Okay. Um, the next things to note on the dashboard are the import um, records option up the top right here of the activity log. Um, basically this gives um, data source administrators a way of getting records into the registry as sort of a one-off process. So the three options we have uh, from a URL, from pasted XML and from the harvester. So I'll quickly go through each one of those. Um, the first one from a URL allows us to basically point to a URL where we have a RIVCS XML file to upload into the registry. I've got one in the data source account settings page. So I'll just grab the URL. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Ben. So I'll just click on from a URL and basically the URL that I've got here is just a uh, RIVCS XML file sitting on Dropbox. So it's publicly available in Dropbox um, and it's valid RIVCS XML. Um, and I just click the import records button. That basically imports that, that single record that I have in my file. It'll give you uh, a little bit of information about the import. So uh, how long it took, um, how many records were in the feed, how many were created and updated and uh, re-indexed the record count. That information is also put into the activity log. Um, so you'll see here the activity log is updated itself. Um, and basically, it's the top one here. I can just click on that and find out the same information that was displayed via the upload by URL, import by URL, sorry. Uh, the next option is import via pasted XML. Um, and this is a really handy way of just getting a, you know, a quick um, dummy record into the, into the environment or a record that you've been working on in, say, our demo environment and you want to import it into production once you've sort of got it ready and you're ready to publish that into Research Data Australia. Um, so I'll quickly just grab some Roof CS XML. Don't mind me flicking around the page quickly. So basically, I'm just viewing the RIVCS XML for a record I have in the, in the registry already, copying and pasting it into the import via pasted XML. So I've just pasted the registry object RIVCS XML in there. Um, you'll note there's a little note here basically saying that the, the tool is um, not really uh, appropriate for really large harvests or, or copy and paste of a lot of records, um, just sort of you know up to 100 records. It, it will manage pretty easily. Um, you'll also notice a little note here basically saying that it uses an advanced harvest mode of standard. Um, and basically that just means um, that any records in the feed will, will be um, ingested um, and there won't be any deleting going on. Um, so I'll just click import records. Again, it will give me the information um, about the import, the, the same as the import by URL, and an activity log uh, will also be created. Um, so there are two really quick ways of, of getting records in as sort of a one-off process um, into the registry and then they're, they're extremely helpful when uh, doing some testing and looking how your records appear in Research Data Australia. Uh, the next option on the list is import records via, from the harvester um, and basically this initiates the harvest to run uh, at the system date and time. So as soon as you click that button it will schedule a harvest um, for, for basically right now. It will use all the harvest settings that you've got configured in your data source account. 
Um, so it'll, it'll pick up from the URI that you've specified there and the provider type, etc. Um, if you've got a reoccurring scheduled harvest and you click from the harvest, there is sort of a, a direct import right now. It will cancel the harvest that you've got scheduled already, import the records in the new harvest, and then reschedule based on your settings in the data source account um, the next harvest based on your date and, and frequency. Uh, so there are the three import options via the page, quick and easy. Uh, the next one is the export records button which just allows you to export the records in your data source. So you, you get the options to um, select which class types you'd like to, to export and which statuses. So you may have a heap of records in draft that you want to export and, and put them in another environment or something. Uh, and that's just a quick and easy way of exporting your records. Uh, the other things on the, the dashboard page are just the, the summaries on the right hand side here and this just gives you three different views of the records, uh, summary views of the records in your data source. So the top one we have is just by status, so you can see that we've got nine drafts, uh, one submitted for assessment and 99 published records. These also add uh, act as quick links to the Manage My Records page and by clicking on those you'll be taken to a filtered view of the Manage My Records page. Um, the next one down is just the class summary, so the breakdown of the records by class, and then at the bottom we've got the quality summary, so the quality levels based on uh, the validation against the metadata content requirements. Um, that's pretty much it for the, the import records page. I know I'm going very quickly. Um, it's, it's just because we do have a lot to go through, and last time I did this uh, presentation it took an hour and a half. Um, so if I do skip over something really quickly and, and you want to ask questions, feel free to, to pop it in the chat before I go too far so it's still relevant, um, or you can hold on to them at the end and, and we can skip back if we've got time. Um, so the next page I'm just going to go to the, is the Manage Records page. Um, I'll show you these quick links just to get there as an example. So just clicking on the drafts link in the, in the summary table here, it'll take me off to the Manage Records page with a filter for draft records. I'll just clear that filter so that you have a, a complete view of the Manage Records page before I go through. Um, so a few things on the Manage Records page. Uh, the publishing workflow, uh, which a lot of you uh, sort of are familiar with, hasn't changed at all. It's exactly the same. Um, if your data sources are required to be quality assessed by ANS um, assessors, you'll see the view that I have currently. So you'll see all the all the statuses in the workflow. So more work, work required, draft, submitted for assessment, assessment in progress, approved and, and published. If you are a data source provider who doesn't need to do the QA, um, you'll just see that the draft and the published statuses with the option of turning on approved if you'd like to use that. Um, you'll notice that the we're basically um, it, it's very similar to the old um, manage my records screen in that we've broken up the records by status into tables. The tables are now listed uh, vertically instead of horizontally, um, which just gives us a little bit more real estate to play with. In each of the tables, there's a separate row for for an individual record, um, and you'll see that we have the title of the record. Um, and if you hover your key over that, you'll actually get the title and the key. So the key is the last bit there after the dash, collection 28. Um, you can view the class type of, of each of the records just by the icon here. You can hover your mouse over just to find out the tooltip for that. Um, Selecting records. So there's a, there's a number of ways to select records on the Manage My Records screen, on the Manage Records screen. Um, there are some really handy ways. Um, first, it's just selecting a single record. It's just by clicking in any white area or actually on the title itself of the record. Just clicking once will select that record and clicking again will be selected. Uh, one thing to note is if your mouse is moving as you go to click, sometimes it won't, won't select. So you, your mouse has to be stable. Um, before, before you click to select. Um, a, a really handy way of selecting multiple records that are in a group, um, which is very similar to working in, uh, in the Mac environment or Windows environment, is holding down the shift key. So if I select the first record, hold down the shift key and then select the last record in a range, you can select those records um, in that manner. There's also a little drop down box uh, contextual menu at the top here which just gives you some options to deselect the records and, and do other things which I'll go through. So I'll just deselect those and show you another selection method. Uh, the next selection met method, um, which is again on Windows and on Mac for file systems, um, is the control or command key. Command key on Mac, control on Windows. Um, it allows you to select multiple records that aren't within a, a range or a group. So holding down the control key, click the first record, click, click the third, 
and, and click whichever other records I'd like to select going forward. Um, and there's some really handy ways of selecting records. Um, the other options are, are hidden in menus. So if I just deselect these records, when you've got no records selected in a table and you use the drop down contextual menu, it'll actually give you a selection menu because you can't do anything with that menu until you select records. So clicking the little down chevron here, I'll get the selection menu where I can select all the records in the table, select only the visible records, um, select no records, so deselect the records, or only select records which have a, a flag attribute. Now the two top menus aren't very clear there, so I'll slip, skip over to the published um, table and you'll see that there's actually 99 records in the table, but there's only 20 visible. So that's the difference between those two menu items there. Um, so by selecting the 99, I select all the records in the table and then can action them. Okay, the next step I'll go through is just actioning records on the page. Um, so there's a number of, again, a number of ways to do this and it'll be personal preference. Um, basically, the icons that are shown when you hover your mouse over a record uh, are sort of the immediate actions that a lot of people will use. So you'll see that we have a view icon and an edit icon and an advanced status icon. There's three here. Um, obviously, the, the advanced status is going to move it into submit it for assessment. The edit is going to take it to the add record screen to edit and the viewer is going to take it to a registry view. So they're sort of the immediate actions that we've got on each of the records. Um, you'll notice that some of the records won't have all the options in them when you hover your mouse over, excuse me, and that's just comes down to your uh, user role and permissions within the registry. Um, so a QA can actually move this um, submitted for assessment record into assessment in progress and a data source administrator won't be able to. Um, so your role will basically define what options you see on the screen. Um, additional options to action records um, are via the more button. So just by clicking on the more button, it will select that record for me and you'll get the additional options that are hidden away, um, which don't get used um, all the time. So we've got the flag option where we can flag the record. Um, again, moving the record into submitted for assessment. We can edit, we can delete the record and we can deselect the record. Uh, the, as I went through before, this top level um, menu up here, the little down chevron arrow, it's basically a way of actioning multiple records. Um, so if I select multiple records again using the shift key and then use the little down arrow to access the contextual menu, um, it'll basically give, you, give me actions for multiple records so I can submit this, all these records into assessment just by clicking. Um, Okay, so the next one, which I kind of briefly went over, is moving records on the screen. Um, again, number of ways, personal preference. Uh, the way I just showed is by selecting a number of records and then using the, the multi-record um, action menu at the top right here. The other option is uh, to action individual records is the, the advanced stat status button, and that will move the record into the next status to the right. Um, but probably the most handy and really quick way of moving records around is, is drag and drop. Um, so basically if I select either one record or multiple records, I can actually click with the mouse, hold my mouse button down and drag that into the next table. And that's a really quick and handy way of moving records around on the screen. You'll notice when I did that then, so I'll select again and move my mouse. The table that I'm going to, which is pretty much always the next table to the right, it's going to highlight blue, basically telling me that that move is uh, permissible, that I can actually move them into that status. If you can't move them into a table, you'll see that it won't highlight at all, so the action is not allowed, and, and releasing the, the records on that table will do nothing. Um, so once again, just dragging, my table will highlight blue, release my mouse, and, and the, the records will be moved over. Um, another a quick and a quick and good uh, hint to know is, is basically the contextual menus that you get when you use the more or the down arrow once you have some records selected um, is basically accessible uh, by the right click on a mouse as well. Um, so just clicking right uh, with the right mouse button I can bring up that contextual menu and, and move records um, which is another really quick way of moving records around once I've selected them. Um, so I can flag these records really quickly just with the right click. And that, that's a handy um, thing to know. Uh, the next one is viewing records. A lot of people will obviously want to view their records once they get them into the registry or edited and saved them. Again, a number of ways, the view icon, the more link to show the contextual menu and then I can view a record. 
and the top menu. The other option is to double click on a record itself. So just by double clicking on the record, I'm taken to the view um, within the registry for that record. And I'll go through this page in a little bit more detail shortly. So just flick back to the Manage My Records page. Okay, the next thing I'll show is just the, the metadata content requirements um, and the quality level icons that are shown. So they're the little coloured icons you'll see top right in each of the record rows. So they're the ones, the twos and the threes. Um, basically just by clicking or hovering your mouse over that will bring up the quality report for that individual record. Um, this was uh, this um, concertina style box was existing in the old registry and works exactly the same just by clicking on the, the title of each of the quality levels you can expand and contract those sections. And you'll see by default when I open a quality report it will default to the next quality level that's to be met. This one's three, they've all been met so they've all got green ticks but if I go to a one you'll see the quality level two is expanded and it tells me uh, the metadata requirements that, that are missing or need to be met. Um, I thought I had a better example. Here's one. Here's a two down the page. So just again, I'm in quality level two. Level three is open by default, and you'll see that two of the requirements in level three have been met, and there's four remaining, which is the yellow ones to be met. And so that's a quick and easy way of, of accessing the quality report for each of the records on the page. Um, and I'll go through some filtering options, which allow you to sort of really focus on those records which are of lower quality. Um, the error icon that you see in the draft here is basically takes um, over from the quality icon when there's an error in a, in a record. So basically the quality is sort of irrelevant until you've you fixed the error. And again, just by hovering your mouse over, you'll get a listing of all the, all the errors that are, that are in that record. Um, there's a little close X up on the top of each of these pop-ups, or you can take your mouse off and it will time out after a short delay. Um, okay, so a couple of filtering options we have on the page. So we have the search, we have the filter drop down. I'll go through the search one first. Now the search is really handy if you're a data source administrator and you have thousands of records in your um, in your tables. It's a really quick way of finding the records that you want. So the search itself um, searches the names of records and also the keys of records. Um, so where's an example? So nested collection three here has a collection a key of collection 28. So if I put in collection 28. It'll bring me back both versions of nested collection three. They both uh, got the same key because one's in draft and one's in, in published status. So that's searching the key. And then if I search by the title, it'll bring me back the same records. So that's a really quick and easy way of finding records with maybe the same key um, or, or, the, or titles that, you, that, that you're looking for. Once I've done a search and I want to go back to the, the default sort of um, view of management records, I can just hit the search with a little X on it and that will clear that search filter. The other option is sort of some predefined filters that we've got which are based on the, the record attributes themselves. So we've got filter by the different statuses, uh, by the class types and by the quality levels, um, records with flags um, and records with tags which is basically for internal staff at the moment. So as I was saying before, if you've got um, a number of quality level one records which are quite low and you want to do some work on those, you can just select the, the quality level one and it'll show you all the quality level one records within um, your data source. That's a really quick and easy way of focusing in on those records that, that may need attention. Um, okay. Uh, the option to sort the tables, so there's, there's just a couple of sort options currently. Um, we have the date modified and the quality level. Um, this will probably be ex expanded in, in further releases with things like the title and, and keys and things like that, things that are relevant and people need. Um, what's probably not straight away intuitive is the fact that if you click on it once, you get the sort direction one way and then if you go back in the menu again, you, you get the sort the opposite way. So date modified at the moment is descending. If I click it again, it'll, it'll switch to ascending and you'll see there's a little arrow there just to indicate which way the sort order is um, going. So again, if I just click quality level, I'll sort by the quality level one way and click it again, it'll sort by the opposite way. Um, the other thing uh, where I was talking about data source administrators with really large numbers in their tables, we default to showing 20 records in a, in a table. So over here in the publish table, I'm, I'm currently showing 20 records. At the bottom, there is a show more tab. And each time you click that, it'll show the next 20. Um, 
which is probably okay if you've only got, say, 100 records and you want to display them all and look through them. Um, but if you've got thousands, it's probably much quicker to use the filtering options that I just went through. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the Managed Records page. Um, one thing to point out on the pages that I haven't so far is just their little help links. So on the dashboard page, on the Managed Records page, on the settings page, there's a little help link here. Um, after on, on release day, when you click that, it'll basically bring up some help in, inside the system um, and it'll take you through the different options in the screen. Um, and hopefully everything you need is going to be in, in that help file. The next screen I'll, I'll quickly touch on is the, the View Deleted Records. Um, page. Um, there's a little button here on the Manage Records page to view deleted records. There's also an option on the dashboard to access the same page, view deleted records. Basically, the view, view deleted records page allows you to um, view and, and reinstate, if you wish, um, published records that have been deleted from your data source. Um, so you'll see that there's been a number of records here that have been deleted out of my data source. You'll see that the top one here, the deleted key party 51, there's actually two versions of it. I'll go through revisions in a little bit um, when I'm looking at the view page, but this is basically two saved versions, two saved published versions of this record have been in the system, and you'll see the dates associated with those versions on the right-hand side. By clicking on um, the, the title itself, I'll, it'll actually expand down and give the options to either view the RIVCS, so that may be that I want to copy and paste the RIVCS and re-import it by the options I went through previously, or just view RIVCS to see what was in the record at that date and time. Um, and then you get the option to reinstate the record. And basically this is going to push it back into your active records as, as a status of draft. Um, so if I just click reinstate, again it gives me the little activity information to say that what's happened, how long it took, and how many records were pushed in. Um, and then if I went back to the Manage My Records page and had a look, that the record Party 51 has been reinstated into draft. And I guess that's going to be really helpful for people if there's multiple data source administrators and somebody accidentally deletes something, um, it'll be stored there if, you, if it is a published record and you can reinstate those in. Um, the next one I'll go through again using the, the sub-level menu for data source accounts is the reports page. Um, I'll click on that. Basically this is similar to what we used to have on the, excuse me, manage my records page in the existing registry. It gives you both a, a report on the quality overview in your data source account and also the status view. Um, so basically the quality view, um, it'll basically give you a 100% bar chart with a breakdown of the quality of the records in each of the class types. So you can see in the top um, bar chart bar here in the chart for collections, um, I've got the three quality levels. So you can see the key up the top here, quality level one is orange. If I put my mouse and just hover over, it'll actually tell me how many records, or how many collection records I have in my data source um, with quality level one. And again for quality level two and quality level three. Um, the chart itself can be filtered by the statuses, so you may only be interested in the, the quality uh, of your published records, which are visible in Research Data Australia. Um, so by clicking that, I'm just showing the, the quality information for my published records. If you don't have any records in a specific status, um, it, it won't display. Maybe sort of more, more of the, yeah. So it'll just tell you that there's no record data to display. Um, one thing to note for uh, existing data source administrators that have been using that data source quality check tool in the existing registry, so people using projects where they have to print those out and submit them to ANS, uh, CLOs or quality assessors, that's still available and it's available, available via the view detail quality report link. So just by clicking on that, it'll give me, um, got the wrong status, sorry, all the records and then quality report. Um, and it'll basically give you the same breakdown as it used to. So it'll give you the information of the record and the missing requirements for each of those records. And you can, obviously there's a print option there, um, just a little bit of a warning there saying that some of these reports can be really big, especially if your data source has got you know, 15,000 records in it, it may not be wise to print it. Um, and, and going forward, you may not need to print them, you may just need to point the CLOs or the um, quality assessors in the direction of this report and they can basically view it online. Um, so that's the, the detailed quality report. Um, the next one down is the, the status overview, and this basically just gives you some um, pie charts for the breakdown of the um, your collections um, 
by their status. So collection records uh, by status, your party records by status. Um, and again, we just have a little key there. So you can see in the service records here, all of my service records are, are published. So that's why it's completely green like an apple. Um, the other thing to note on this page is just the download link. So if, if for some reason you are interested in the data behind these charts and you want to use it in your own system, there's actually a little Excel um, icon up the top here next to the title and you can click that and get a download of, of the figures that you use to generate your chart. Uh, okay, I think that's it for the reports page. Uh, the next one I'll go through is the settings. Um, so the settings page itself is the data source account settings. Um, so by clicking on the settings link, I'm taken to uh, sort of a read-only view of the settings in my data source account. And as, as many of you will know, this is the configuration for your data source account. So um, your records management and harvest the settings and sort of a little bit of admin information about the account. So there's an edit button at the top here from the view page. Um, if I come from the dashboard, so I'll just click back to the dashboard, there's actually a direct edit settings button here on the dashboard which takes you straight into edit mode um, of the data source account. Now for existing data source administrators you'll notice that in the existing system we had one page for all the settings and it was getting quite long with all the new functionality that we were adding. So for this release we've broken it up into three separate tabs. So the first one is the account administration information which obviously stores the information about your account and a little bit of information about yourself. Um, it's good to keep this stuff up, up to date, so the email and the contact name in case there is something that we're releasing or we need to do downtime, we can contact you via those details. Nothing has, there, there's no real options um, that have been uh, added for this release, so the options that were in the existing registry are the same, they're just split out into the tabs. So in the records management, still have the reverse links, still have the create primary relationships um, and still have the contributor page options in there. Um, the Harvester Settings tab, um, basically still the same settings that we've had previously. Um, we still have the advanced harvest modes, etc. Um, you can still schedule it for certain dates and, and, and reoccurring. Uh, the one thing to note is that in the previous system, when you set up Harvest or uh, configured your Harvester settings, once you saved it and you went back into the view page for the data source account, you actually had to click Import Records um, to schedule your Harvest. Now the system will actually detect when you've changed your settings or configured it for the first time. So if I went and changed my um, harvest method to harvest at OAI, the system will pick that up and when I click save, it'll actually reschedule my harvest for all the other configuration options that I've set. You'll notice here that I, I had it on direct before, but now when I put it on harvest OAI, um, I get a test harvest button. Um, and the test harvest obviously works with the harvester, so if I was using direct, we don't use the harvester. So the test harvest button will only show when you're actually a provider with the harvested OAI um, harvest method. Works in the same fashion as it used to. You click the test harvest button. This will probably fail because I'm not set up as an OAI. Um, but it, it will give you a little pop-up showing the activity as it occurs. You can close that down and it will also show the result and, and the activity as it occurs in the activity log on the dashboard. Um, so if I just change, for example, um, my harvest frequency to hourly, the system will pick that up and when I click save, it'll actually, it'll pop up the top to say that the data source was updated. You'll see that um, in the activity log there's a message to say that the settings in my data source account was updated. You'll see the user who updated it, so if there's multiple users or data source administrators for an account, you can sort of keep track of when things were changed and by who. And you'll also see that a new harvest has been scheduled for me um, and the details of that harvest on save. Okay. Next one I'll go through is just the record view. Um, we are sort of running short on time, so I'll try and move along a bit quicker. Um, I'll just go to the Manage My Records page again. Just a view of records, you can just double click or use the view icon. Um, I'll choose a better example. Um, so this is the view page in the registry, pretty similar to what it used to be. We have it structured out in basically the RivCS element blocks on the left hand side here. Um, so that's pretty much what we had in the existing registry. You'll see that there's a quality report available now on the right hand side. Um, again, works the same, you click and expand for the record that you're viewing. There's a, a quick link to edit up the top here which will take you to add record screens for this record itself. Um, you can preview it in Research Data Australia via the preview link, which we'll go through in a second. 
Um, you'll also see some registry metadata. Um, a lot of it will probably not be relevant to Twitter data source administrators, um, or some of it won't be, uh, some of it will be. Um, things like when it was last changed and when the record was created obviously will be. Um, things like the slugs and IDs are, are more for internal ANS use. <clears throat> you'll see the status here it, it published, um, and there's a little bit of information about the title. There's an option to delete the record obviously on this page as well, so you can action it. Um, you'll notice on the right here there is the revisions. Now again, I sort of showed this quickly on the deleted um, records page, um, and these are all the revisions of, of this red record in the registry. So each time you edit and save this record, we actually save a revision. So you can actually go back to those revisions and either reinstate them, copy and paste the RIVCS and uh, import it again, um, or just basically look at how a record was back in a certain day. Um, basically the, the revision um, dates in here act as links, so if I click on April 12 here, it will load that um, older version of this record, the version um, previous. You'll see in the, the registry metadata it's got a status of superseded, basically saying that this, not, this is not the current record, and you can view the RIVCS or export the RIVCS um, for this record itself. So that's pretty much the view page. Um, a few helpful, um, I think, few options that we've added in, in this release there. Uh, the next one is the add record uh, that I'll go into. Um, I obviously can't edit this record because I'm in the superseded um, version. I'll just switch back to the other revision. You'll see there's an edit option up at the top here. And also on the manage my records page, we have the little edit icon or via the contextual menus. So I'll just edit this reverse relationships record and that'll take me into um, the add record screen for an existing record. So it'll obviously populate each of the tabs with the, the data um, that was that is within that record already. I'll just flick back, leave this page without saving. You'll notice on the, the top right hand side of the manage records page we have a button to add a brand new record um, and also via the my data menu which is always available in the registry um, you can add a new record via the, the option up there. By clicking that, I get the four class types that I can add. It gives you a little bit of a description about each of the one, each of the class types in case you're not aware. Uh, and then each of the blue um, buttons down the bottom allow me to add that class type. So by clicking the add collection, I get the add regis new registry object form. Um, and basically that uh, allows me to enter the mandatory RIVCS um, data that needs to be entered to create a new record. You'll notice that there's a little um, generate key button on the right hand side here. A lot of people have problems thinking up keys or, or um, deciding what their keys should be. We've provided a generate random key button. It's a really quick and easy way just to generate uh, a key for a record and it's going to be unique obviously within the registry. Select the data source that you want to put the record under. Again the group that you'd like to display your record under in Research Data Australia. So just quickly enter that. Um, and then the type of the record, so the type of collection that I'd like to enter. You'll notice um, in the drop downs in the add record screens for this release, we've actually added the de definitions for each of the terms in our vocabularies, where, whereas previously it just said, I think, RIVCS vocabulary type was something that wasn't really helpful. So you can actually see and decide on what you're selecting now, which is really, really helpful. So just select catalog or, in or index and click add new. And again, it takes me to the add record screen. Um, it's populated the fields that I've just entered on that first initial form, which are the mandatory fields. Um, and then basically it's very similar to the existing ad record screens. The tabs have obviously moved from the top down to the left hand side here. Um, and that basically just gives us a little bit more real estate to work with. You'll notice we still have the orange and blue icons, which basically uh, point you towards um, the metadata content requirements um, for their record. So if I just click on the names tab, we'll see that there's a one with an orange icon. And you'll see that there's a message up the top here basically saying that the primary name is required for the collection record. Um, Again, it works very similar if you're familiar with the old screens. If you come into a tab and you want to add a new uh, name element, for instance, you just click the Add Name button and it will give you the fields to enter. Again, the types themselves have got the description underneath for each of the types, so you can make the decisions a little bit easier. You can add, obviously, multiple elements wherever it's, it's possible within the schema. To remove them, it's just the little red Xs uh, that are shown beside each of the fields or within the, the element itself. So just clicking the X will remove. Uh, once you've done all your edits, um, you can click the Save and Validate down the bottom here, the Save and Validate tab or the Save and Validate button up the top right here. Uh, and that'll take you to the, basically the Save um, tab. 
You get a little message to say that your record's been saved. Um, any errors within the record will um, also give you a little highlight at the top. So this one here, we've got uh, validation errors. You'll see that um, on the left here, I've now got a little red icon um, basically showing me how many errors I've got in that specific tab. If I go back to that tab, you'll see that there are some errors with each of these fields. Um, so I'll just select a primary name type and give this a JB test name, and I'll just remove this element and click save. So once those errors are all gone, um, we get some options to action the records itself. So the record actions here. If you're in the QA workflow, you'll see the submit for a record assessment. Um, this is just a way of pushing it straight to ANS for their assessment. If you're not within the QA workflow, you'll, you'll get an option to publish the record directly. The finished edit, editing option here just takes you back to the Manage My Records uh, page and leaves the record in a status of draft. Um, the view options on the right here, you can obviously go back to the view page and just view it in the registry or you can view it in Research Data Australia. Now the thing to note um, with the preview in Research Data Australia, um, in the previous system we basically had a preview page and then we had an RDA page. In R10 we've blown away the preview page and you actually preview the record directly in Research Data Australia. Um, and the, the benefits of that is you will actually see how it's going to view, how it's going to appear in Research Data Australia, whereas the existing system we had some, um, basically some gaps in the display and some limitations in the display, um, which are now, have been resolved. Um, I won't preview this record because it doesn't have much data. I'll show you one in a second. The other thing to note down here is, that, again, the quality report where you get throughout the registry. So this is for the record. You can see what you're missing, go back and edit the record and fill out. One thing that will probably make a few users, if not many users, happy is as part of this release, um, the, reverse relinks, the reverse links relationships are actually taken into account in the metadata content requirement checks. Um, this also happens for contributor page links um, and also primary links that can be set up in the data source account. So for example, if in my feed I have all my collections pointing, or all my party records pointing to my collection records, in the existence, existing system, if I came into um, my collection records, you'd see that there is a warning here, the collection must be related to one party record. And that, that basically will be gone now. So the reverse link that will take effect will basically point my collection back to my um, party record and I will meet this requirement. Um, so that's one of the things that's been flagged a lot of times through services that people would like to see that. Um, and it's, it's a huge improvement in this release. Um, I'll quickly just say that the, the PIDs um, stuff is available via the identifiers menu top right. Um, when you're obviously a PIDs user, you'll see the menu item. If you're not a PIDs user, you won't see the item. Um, the PIDs hasn't been updated for this release, so you'll have to be navigated to an old view of the system. Works exactly the same way, and in the future releases, we'll actually update that into the, the new look and feel of the registry. Um, so I promised a, a view of um, a a record in Research Data Australia. Um, I'll just go back to the Manage My Records page, which can be accessed by the breadcrumb at the top here. I'll just go back to JB Test Data and view one that's probably got a bit more information. Oh, sorry. Sorry for skipping around. I'll view one that's in draft um, and then preview it in Research Data Australia. And that's got no record information in it either. Sorry, bad example. But you'll see that at the top here we have draft preview just to alert you that you are viewing a draft record. The connections that you view will be, obviously, if you're looking at a draft record, would be connections to everything in the same level or above. So if I'm looking at a, a published record, I obviously won't see the connections back down to a draft record if you're viewing it in Research Data Australia. Um, and that's obviously what people are going to see when they're viewing your records in Research Data Australia. Just flip back into the registry. So if that was a quick preview into Research Data Australia. I'll take you that into that in a second. Um, I'll quickly just go through the DOI query tool, there's not much change, that so will be quick. Um, basically, in the DOI query tool, if you're a site my data user, under the identifiers menu, you'll see my DOI identifiers menu item. Click that, it'll take you to the DOI query tool, which some of you will have already seen. Changes for this release are we've um, incorporated some ACL stuff, which allows us to basically map application IDs to users and organisations within the registry. One of the benefits is that is we now have a drop down which allows you to quickly access all the app IDs that you have um, access to basically. So just by the drop down I'll just select this application ID, click this my DUIs. The page itself hasn't really changed, all the options are the same. 
the site except for this update button. So what we've done for this release is allow users to update the URL which is associated with a DOI itself. So just by clicking the update button I get a little form. It has the um, existing URL um, in, in the field and I can then update that with whatever I want. Click the update button. That'll fire off a request through our system into data site and update the DOI itself and you'll see that it's updated down here. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, it, it, it is a big step forward for, for users that are changing their URLs and their DOIs and they just got to do a one-off or something. Um, that's going to be a really handy thing to note though is when you're changing your URLs um, and you do it with DOIs, just note in your app ID configuration the domains that you're actually allowed to change it to. If there's one missing then you obviously have to submit a request to services to add that to your account. Um, so that's pretty much it for the registry itself. I think I've gone through everything on my list for the registry. I know we're running out of time. Um, I'll go through RDA now. So I'll just flick back to the home page, um, which is accessible via the ANS logo up in the top left of the registry, which is all always available. So quick, quick access to the home page. And you see we have a Visit Research Data Australia button on the home page itself. You can also obviously get there when you're viewing a record and hitting the preview button. You can navigate into Research Data Australia. So I'll just click that and we'll load into Research Data Australia. Okay, so Research Data Australia, a quick overview. It's basically the same functionality. It has been reskinned to have a new sort of modern look. Um, it's got improved spatial capabilities. Uh, it's a lot faster than the, the old existing Research Data Australia. Um, and I've already gone through the draft records being able to be viewed in Research Data Australia in the way they would um, for other users. The home page itself um, is very similar to how it used to be. We have the search up the top here. We, now, we have the browse by subject link here, which takes you to browse by um, the controlled vocabulary, ANZ, SRC, FOR. Um, we again have the, the types of records that are in Research Data Australia, a little description in case people are landing on this page from, say, Google or something, they're not sure what a collection is. These also operate as links to a search for all the collections within the registry. You'll notice the spotlight has actually changed from um, to a spotlight on research data itself. This has an editor behind it in the registry now that and staff can actually um, dynamically put content into Research Data Australia. So we can um, highlight news items when the system's changed, any new exciting collections and things um, that we want to highlight basically. The Who Contributes, which used to be a, a long list of groups on the, the home page, has actually moved to its own page. Um, I won't go in there, it's literally just the same list on a separate page. Um, and in future releases, we'll enhance that with some icons and some information about each of the contributors. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the home page. Um, one thing to note, if you are a DSA and you want to get back into the registry, we still have the link down the bottom here, the ANS Online Services, and that will take you back to the to the registry. Um, when you're in a record view page, there'll obviously be another link to uh, link back to the registry view of that record itself, which I'll show in a minute. Now the options up the top here, the browse by map coverage is um, it's it's not new, it's enhanced. Um, if I click on browse by coverage. We get a large map now. We used to have the map search, which was quite a small map um, tucked away in the advanced search. We now have a, a much larger map, which is obviously going to be helpful for people looking for collections with spatial coverage. You get a little bit of help information up the top here of how to actually use the map. It's fairly straightforward. We have a hand tool or a, a polygon tool. Uh, the hand tool is by default so you can move yourself around the map. We have the, the normal Google map um, navigation item, which is to zoom in, zoom out, and move around. Um, you can obviously use the scroll on your mouse as well to zoom in. Once I've found a, a place that I want to start um, doing a, a search for the region, I select um, my polygonal rectangle tool uh, and then I just click and drag to define a region I want to search within. Now you'll notice uh, what's come up on the page is a couple of single items, uh, icons, and a, a couple of multiple icons. Now the multiple icons themselves are new for this release, um, and they basically point to um, multiple collections or multiple records with spatial coverage in the same area. Some of them will operate as, um, will, will operate as, and they'll, they will zoom in when I click on them. Um, hopefully this one will. So where there's a cluster of records basically in the same sort of small region, and I'm 
zoomed out, they would be clustered together and show me how many records are within that region itself. So if I zoom back out, you'll see there's 18 records, which is probably in a small region around this. If I click on that, it'll actually zoom me into the map and break out the, cl the cluster further, showing me the individual items and any further clusters that are within um, the, the smaller region. Some of the icon, some of the cluster icons, though, when you click on them, they won't actually zoom any further, and that's where you've got uh, records which have exactly the same spatial coverage. So they may have um, the same spatial region, or they may all be sitting on a point. Um, so I'll see one of these. No, that's not going to do it. I'll try and find one. Oh, this is the first one I find. <laughs> This one. Hey, there we go. So once a cluster sort of zoomed in as far as it goes, you'll actually get a listing of the records that are within that cluster. And by clicking on that, you can obviously navigate off to that, that collection or, or part of your service or whatever the class is for that record. Um, so the clusters are handy, a uh, little sort of navigation and um, display tool on the maps um, to get your sort of head around. Um, again, if it can be broken down further into into multiple uh, regions that will zoom in. If not, it'll display you a list of the records. Uh, I've zoomed back out so you can see that the region that I've selected here, when you have individual markers um, which have a spatial region defined within them, so for a single record, when you hover your mouse over, you'll actually see the spatial region that's defined. So just hovering this over this one on the left here, will actually show you the spatial um, region that's defined within that, that record itself. And you'll see that it's actually intersecting with the the red rectangle that I've got on the screen. You also have facets on the search, uh, the, the map search itself. So if you want to limit by certain subjects, uh, classes, or, or who it's been contributed by, these are the same facets that you'll find on a normal search in Research Data Australia. Um, so if you just want to find collections with, which are within that area, you can um, limit your search using the facets for collections. Um, and that's a handy way. You've obviously got the X next to each of the facets just to clear them, um, or the X up in the search box, which will clear the search entirely. So that's the map search. Uh, uh, just a quick one, that the facets themselves can be um, shown and hidden. Um, so if you're on a search um, and you've got a lot of icons that are showing on the right-hand side and you want to view them all, you can just show and hide the facets themselves to, to view the complete map. Um, again, with Google Maps, we have the option to turn on satellite view. So if you actually want to look what's in the region and not just the map view, you can zoom in and obviously see the topography of, a, of an area or what's actually there. Um, so that's the Browse by Map. The Browse by Subject, just very quickly, existing functionality we had in existing Research Data Australia uh, allows you to search um, through all the, the records that have got ANZF, FOR um, subjects defined with them. Within them, obviously, a tree structure that you can uh, break down into the different um, levels. And then by clicking on that, you'll get the collections that contain that ANZ FOR um, subject. So I won't go through that one in detail. The search itself um, is very, very similar to existing RDA. Um, instead of having the facets down the left-hand side, we've moved them to the right-hand side. We had feedback from numerous users that the display of a in the view page itself had all the little like all the little boxes down the right-hand side, and they're a little bit confused. So we've moved it over to the right-hand side. They work exactly the same way as existing RDA. Just by clicking on it, will actually uh, filter uh, by that facet itself, and you can clear it via the X. Um, we we have pagination. Exactly the same existing RDA and the tabs across the five tabs across the top, just to quickly filter by the different class types themselves. You'll notice that in the actual search results themselves, we are showing logos for records now. So if a, if a record has a logo defined within the description, so a description type of logo will actually display that in uh, the results itself, which can be handy for institutions and, and things like that. Um, so that's pretty much it for the, the search page. Um, the advanced search itself is just tucked under the search box itself. Again, no change there. Existing functionality allows you to do Boolean searches and things like that and restrict by temporal ranges by clicking on that little checkbox. You get a slider, which is allows you to find records which have um, temporal data specified. Okay, so we do a record view page um, just by clicking on the link in there in the search results. Now, um, just 
disregard all the data that's in here, it's my test data just to show me um, that things are displaying in the correct places on the page. So you'll see the brief description is just brief, brief, brief. That's just to show me that it's displaying in the right way. Um, you'll see that we're now displaying the alternative and abbreviated names that have been defined in RIVCS. So if you've had that previously in a RIVCS feeds and we haven't been displaying it, that will show below. Um, you'll see the logo is also displayed, which is existing functionality. Thing to note on the description is that uh, we obviously show the first brief description by default, um, and then we have a show all descriptions link here to show all the descriptions. We're now displaying the um, the type of description above each of the description blocks. Um, and basically, in previous releases, people were confused about um, if something was a delivery method or a note or a significant statement or, or rights or something like that. So we've actually added that for this release, and that's going to be really useful as well. Okay. The next one I'll go through is just the, the connections box change. Um, basically, instead of firing off straight to the next record by clicking on the links in the connection box, so these are all the related um, objects in the in Research Data Australia to the one I'm viewing. By clicking on a link itself now, I get a preview of that actual record before I fire off. Um, into the view of it, so you'll see that I can hover over the preview. There's um, the relationship to that record itself is shown in the top, the title, and then the actual brief description. And this one is really, really long. Um, there's a link, obviously, down the bottom in the, in that pop-up to obviously navigate to that full record. Um, and there's a closed box, or you can just take your mouse off, and it will time out um, and remove itself. Um, the next one I'll show is just identifier types. So just a, a small change of this release. Known identifier types, if they have a, an icon um, associated with them, we actually display them now. So you see the little trove icon, the DOI icon, the handle icon. If they're obviously URLs that can be navigated to, we just have the external link icon shown, which is a, you know, pretty much a standard across websites these days. Uh, the other thing to note is we're now supporting ORCID IDs um, in, in our vocabulary for identifiers in RIVCS. So if you um, add an identifier of ORCID or lowercase, it will actually display it in Research Data Australia with the ORCID um, icon and also a link which will take you off and resolve that record in ORCID itself. The last one that I'll show you is, uh, is sort of a big one for this um, release. Sorry, typo. Is nested collections. So these are relationships that are defined um, basically using the RIVCS relationships of ha has part and is part of. It allows you to, to define a hierarchical structure of, uh, of objects, basically, and we will display them in this little format tree um, in the view page in Research Data Australia. So in, in the collection structure, you'll see that one is highlighted always in, in orange. One or more will be highlighted if it's the same record. Um, it'll be highlighted, and that's the record that I'm currently on within the tree structure. So that's the one that's highlighted orange. You'll see the ones below. Again, I can click on these like in the connections box, and I get a preview of the record itself. You get the title, which you can click on to navigate to that record, and you also have the full, full view full record link down the bottom. So I'll just click over that record, and you'll see in the collection structure on this page. So anywhere with it, if you're a collection, if you have a collection that's defined within that structure, whenever you go to one of those collections, you'll get this collection destruct, structure display in Research Data Australia. You'll see now that the next item down in the tree has been highlighted orange, and that's the view. That's the record I'm currently viewing in Research Data Australia. There's a little help icon here that will just give you, or the user, whoever's viewing your record, a little bit more information about what the collection structure is and what it represents um, and, and how to navigate it. So again, they're, they're defined using the has part and is part of relationships in collections only, um, and they can get quite complicated. Um, I'll just show you an example. Um, they can get quite complicated. So here we have the collection structure um, where we've got multiple nested levels, basically. You can also get um, cases where a collection you're viewing has two parents, um, and in that, those instances will actually show two different branches um, 
to each of those parents. When you have that two parent scenario, you'll actually see the collection that you're on twice and it will be highlighted twice because it's basically occurring in two different branches itself. Hopefully that made sense. There will obviously be some day one help um, to go with that stuff um, and we can obviously help you out if you have any questions with that. The last thing I'll just touch on, I know we've just gone over, is basically the um, NHMRC grant um, information, data information, um, which some people have been had interest in previously. We've um, actually loaded grants awarded after 2010 into the into the current system, so basically people will be able to link to those and view those um, in Research Data Australia and ORCA. Um, the set includes 16,000 grants, which started in 1994 to 2004. Um, and the grants actually link to the investigators who received a grant after 2009. So I'll just show you an example of this in Research Data Australia. So if we go to the activities, and I'll just filter by. Oh, let me push to this environment. Sorry, flicking around a bit. So I'm just going to filter by the NHMRC um, group in Research Data Australia. So this is going to show me all the activities from NHMRC. And if I just click on the fourth one down here, this is an activity that's been basically imported or harvested out of NHMRC for people to reference, um, to relate to, things like that. One of the big things for this release is we have had grant information in Research Data Australia previously, but it was very much a shell um, record. It would have a title and not much else. For this release, we've been able to pull out um, some information, so some media summary uh, of the grant itself. And we've also been able to pull out the, the investigators and, and researchers that are involved with that grant and actually created them party records. And one of the benefits of that is when you go into an activity, you can actually see the researchers themselves and you can click on and view that researcher and it will actually give you a listing of all the activities that that researcher um, is involved in or, or has been granted basically from the NHMRC. So these three that are listed here, they're not necessarily always going to be from the NHMRC, but these three could be, and by the looks of them, they probably are. And you can see that, that Wayne Tilly here has actually been granted these three activities or has had some um, input and, and uh, his hand in, in these activities. Um, the, the grant types, we have all three categories that have been imported. So we have the research support, um, the people support, and the infrastructure support. So that's going to be really handy for people that are, that are trying to link to their activities and, and find uh, more information about activity and the researchers involved um, going forward. Um, it, obviously, we'll, we'll obviously do our best and I think that the plan is to keep that information as up to date as possible um, and, and we're sort of talking with NHMRC to get some agreement going there where we can get the data sort of harvested on a regular basis um, into the ORCA and Research Data Australia. There are, I won't go through them now, um, but there are ways of actually pulling the grant information directly from our system using web services. Uh, so when you're creating your records, if you want to link them from your system directly, you can actually call us and, and find out information about the grants and things and link to the records that way. Um, but there will be some more information on that um, in post-release. That's pretty much all I have. I know it was a, a whirlwind and, and very rushed. Um, I probably mumbled over a lot. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, by all means, um, type them in the chat box or yeah, type them in the chat box and then we can unmute you and you, you can ask questions and I can go back over things. Um, we will be obviously releasing day one help with the systems um, as part of R10 Go Live. Um, and then in again, as I showed you in Orca itself, on the, the services dashboard, we'll obviously have this news item with links to where you can go to find more help. We'll have the orientation video to show you through the, the registry if you're sort of a bit lost. And then on, on each of the pages, we actually have a help link um, that itself. So in the dashboard, we have a help link in the management records. So if you need to action things, we have the help link top right. Um, so hopefully it's all there. And if it's not and we've missed something, by all means, tell us and, and we'll update it. So do we have any questions at all? No? Okay, well I thank you all for coming. Um, this is obviously that the screencast itself has actually been recorded. Um, so you will obviously, once that's uploaded, have access to it and you can um, mute my, my voice if you'd like to and just go through the screens itself at, at your own pace. Um, and again, the, the help information will be available 
um, in the next week. Um, all users will obviously get an email in the next week just advising of the downtime of the system that we'll have um, it's next Wednesday for the release. Um, it's probably going to be a, a sizable chunk of time, this release, obviously, because it is a, a complete rewrite of, of the registry. Um, there will be a lot of sort of migration stuff that happens on the day, so it's, it's probably going to be a large block of time on that day, so I wouldn't schedule too much in the, in the registry for then. Uh, but you will receive an email with all the, the relevant links and information. There's also, um, on the ANS website, I'll just point to it quickly, under the ANS services news, or the news and events, ANS services news, uh, there will be information there about uh, the release 10, where you can go for more information um, and what's going to be happening on that day. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming.